just want to thank the Center for Fiction for this year, Jerome Foundation. Really great opportunity. I hope you guys this year, the new fellows, enjoy it. It goes by quickly. So, I'm going to read from the horse that I rode in on, which was this novel I had started probably about 15 years ago. Finally finished it this past year, and it's what I submitted to the center when I was trying to get the fellowship. This is about 120 pages into the book, and I hope you enjoy it. In late February, I allowed myself to drift again around the house in the winter's loosening hole in the darkness. My men hitch Fancy Jack to the buckboard before dawn and head down into Glen Henry for their shift in the mines, leaving me to contemplate these lengthening days, the routine of my chores, which carries me into the afternoon. Winter brings its own brand of upkeep upkeep to our property. The roof of the barn seems ready to buckle under the weight of snow growing against it. The support beams haven't been repaired since my father's days, the joists replaced sometime during his final years. Although my husband tries to dissuade me, I climb a ladder rung by rung to the roof to break apart the ice rim in a dam along its treacherous edge. The snow avalanches along the angle and so heavy and swift a load that it explodes on impact against the ground sending a blue jay complaining greatly through the branches of a nearby oak, leaving nothing but the sound of wind in the ladder's upper reaches. A thrill goes through me, but most days don't offer up such a complete release. Most days, I think, like the nights, are quiet. I snatch naps many afternoons, then spend hours breaking through the snow. Beneath this, blankless, this blankness unfurled before me, I can no longer recognize places where I wandered as a child in search of my next adventure. It's strange to discover a once familiar landscape so erased, merely scribbled upon by footprint after footprint, leading me back home where I, when I retrace my steps. The hardwoods are all whispers within the wind. Their branches have been written in quick pencil strokes against the sky. Dotting the snow out in the distance, a fox retreats in a, retreats in a brazen streak of orange. I give futile chase after her with a throat caught fire in the cold. When I slip into a drift that swallows me up to my hips, I'm somehow able amid my heavy breathing to lay a claim to joy in this trudging. My fingers lace across my belly in the promise they may hold, and my breath unfurls in intervals across the sky, a whiteness on the cold blue air. Here alone in the upcountry up now, I allow myself words forbidden in the company of others. They don't hold the practical clang of the movement in the mines or the tools around our house. I tell my story to the snow. Here in my father's house, an hour after dusk, I can almost sense this child already staking his tiny claim inside me. Yes, I do believe I'm carrying the sun within me now, and I haven't been able to shake the feeling for weeks, ever since one intimate night I spent with Ray just after Christmas. My husband lay in the darkness and taught me beyond the windows, silver and frost. Where, Ray, I wanted to ask him, the whole meat of him above me, where is your Lord now? And as I break through the snow each afternoon, I imagine my child growing lean and tall up here in these mountains. I envision his limbs nimble, quick with a curry comb, his fingers in an amazement, puzzling out knots and snarls. My child will have a genuine appetite, he'll butter his biscuits on both sides, he'll relish every gravy, stack his flapjacks high. And when he draws a bucket up from the well, my child will sense the raw chill of the water like something alive inside him. But I'll never teach him to abstain from the savage quenching of his thirst. Never tell him to fear the devil in the water's depths, for these mossy stones surely circle no evil. During these winter months, our last meals of the day, our last meal of the day is generally silent, save the mild sound of our chewing. Ray retires from the table with his pipe, tamps it gently against his hand, then retrieves his Bible from the mantle. John Robert stomps about until whatever variety of agitation within him finds a place to settle. As I wash dish dishes in the kitchen, I watch my, my hands make circles until the trail of soap extinguishes against the plates. Forks shine beside me. I dry them with a tinkling, then give my attention to my mending. After I've sat down in an acrid waft of raised pipe smoke, I stitch my way up the length of a rent in John Robert's pants. I worry over the wear in one of my husband's flannels, consider a patch at the elbow, finally deciding to let it fray. As these, as these evenings slowly rub themselves down to nothing, I observe the tiny brightness of my needle piercing the fabric again and again until it transforms into a silvery blur. 
it's then I question if I've gotten enough sleep, whether I'll be able to outlast my men into the night, for Ray can abide by his Bible for odd hours. John Robert nurtures agitations for days. Good night. And so I managed to stay awake beyond my men yet again. I listened to their tread overhead, watched the logs collapse with a hushed crash, sparks racing through the chimney's gloom. Then I finally light my lamp. When I come before the hallway mirror, I'm startled by a reflection of myself within the glass. It is here where I discover the scratches, the cross-hatching of them over my forearms, a feverish heat against my flesh. Then my musings within the barn, I wonder, lead me one evening into a stall where rusty wire bit. Did I drift into some blackberry bramble as I paused to gaze into the starry sky? Other nights, I've been rattled fully awake when I've come to bump into a piece of furniture that seemed to me perfectly out of place. I've discovered a bruise in the shape of some lost continent against my hip, though I cannot recall what, what slip sent me careening, sliding over the ice beyond these windows, the night blinding such hazards from my view. The days are brighter, but no easier for me to navigate. Storm by storm, the snow erases my footprints through it. I break new ground each afternoon, astounded by the effort it takes to the next skeletal stand of oaks, the night, the light inside an icicle stealing my sight. Beyond the terror brightness etched across my eyes, I reach a spot in the woods where a red-tailed hawk has taken the final life from its prey and feasted. Its wings have beaten their imprints against the snow, two swaths as wide as side swipes, a single feather loose pointed northward. I touch my finger into a smear of blood against all this whiteness, then roll a tuft of the rabbit's fur over the ball of my thumb. A neat length of the creature's entrails remains against the snow. It seems some strange talisman left here for me to read, a sign of the mechanisms that work the world forward, how its days unspool one after the next. I pocket the entrails in my coat along with the feather and trudge further through the snow. Many afternoons I barely make it back to the house before my men have returned from their, the mines. I retrace my steps through the blows of snow that have begun to cover up my path. An odd thrill goes through me when I sense myself forever lost, never return to return to the kitchen gone cold, my, lust, my last supper having passed. But when I've made it beyond a windbreak of poplars, I spy the house hump within a cradle of lowland beyond the barn. I clomp upon the black back step to clean slush from my boots, then blow life into an ashy ember within the kitchen stove. A puddle pulls up my feet against the floorboards, and I hustle from the cupboard with a snack of cornmeal and a can of lard, fumbling a pan as I attempt to get supper started. My heart, my heart turned frantic by the late hour. Need to make a trip to the cellar, I descend into the underground world where I wander some nights when the floor above stifles me with its confines. Here, laurel leaves and holly berries hang from the ceiling <coughs> in a weight arrangement. The cellar appears to be a garden upturned on itself. The withered petals of wildflowers dangling above my head, the once vibrant blooms muted. I pluck a half dozen daisies and apply them to my hair. If I get lost within this late hour, I might again imagine myself the dryad I once read about in a volume of mythology in Miss Shrewsbury's parlor. The nymph, or nymph, I remember, had been cast into the underworld, where she froze in the shape of a tree, limbs still reaching toward a smoke sun, where she starved from lack of light. My arms bend in the attitude of branches. As I imagine my own metamorphosis, I ponder a dryad dying in such a common cellar as this one. And yet, I think, unlike the nymph, I seem to have been given further reason to live. This new blood that beats inside my body, this bark armoring me. Can, can you hear me? Okay, I always want to put my mouth too close to the mic, and I can't ever tell. Um, my name is Lauren. I am going to be reading part of a novel. Um, I want to thank the Center for Fiction for the cash and uh, for a place to work, so thank you. Um, yeah, uh, there's violence in this, military violence, so um, just a warning. Um, okay. In the fall of 1975, I went through BCT at Fort Bragg and was OCS. I became an intelligence officer. 
Joining the Army, as I said, was one of the most important decisions of my life, which isn't to say that I particularly enjoyed my time there. Actually, they kept me in garrison all four years, mostly decrypting and translating intelligence from French. It was work that infuriated me because it made me feel like a secretary or a clerk when I'd signed up to see combat. I met Andrew Slater at Fort Bragg and liked him almost immediately. His eyes were as blue as the North Carolina sky over our heads, and the laugh lines around them made him seem kind. He shook my hand. His voice surprised me by being gently Southern and just slightly higher in pitch than I was expecting. And I couldn't guess at how old he was when we first met. Older than me, I knew, but by three years or by 13, neither answer would have surprised me. He wanted to know what was going on in Zaire, with which a few of my research projects at the time were concerned. It was May 1978, and Zaire's Shaba region had just in erupted into conflict again. The Front National pour la Liberation du Congo, aided by Cuba, was trying to destabilize Mobutu. To that end, 4,000 FNLC rebels had invaded the country from Zambia on, of all whimsical means of transportation, bicycles, and quickly captured Kowesi, a major mining hub for the second time in a year. After a few days in Shaba, the rebels began slaughtering people and taking hostages, a turn of events the world would probably have ignored were it not for the fact that Kowesi was home to a lot of Europeans. Belgians and French mostly, they're extracting copper and cobalt from the earth. But once the FNLC took 3,000 white hostages, France and Belgium decided to act. Americans were there too, nearly 100 working at a Morris Nudson construction camp just a few kilometers north of Kowesi. After a few days had passed, and for some bureau bureaucratic reason I couldn't understand, Morris Nudson still hadn't evacuated its employees. Carter ordered that the 82nd maintain a higher state of readiness. Slater was 82nd Airborne, a pilot. I had a small apartment off post, which he came by a few times when we were both off duty. I was always happy to see him. I never minded his company, as I often minded the company of some of the off other officers. That's not to say that I didn't feel camaraderie with those guys, I did. And I knew that under the stress of combat, those feelings would have turned to fraternal love. But I liked Slater in a different way. That is, immediately and with no caveats. And I trusted him. So our friendship developed fast because of the intensity that the context built into it. He quickly became one of only a few people on base that I truly cared about. I don't mean that in a romantic way. I knew he was married to a fitness instructor of all ridiculous occupations. And before I ever saw her picture, I imagined her as a blonde bouncing around a big windowed condo somewhere in Fayetteville. He eventually did show me a photo of Sandra, and it turned out she was blonde, but it didn't preclude her from being complicated. I remember that her father had just died, and one of Slater's big concerns was that she was heading toward a breakdown, but he felt there was very little he could do for her, being away from home so much. I told him some of the things I'd heard about Kowesi, that an American accused of being a mercenary had been shot, about some footage that had come across my desk, featuring Mobutu soldiers parading around the corpses of a few of the, of, of, a few Europeans FNLC had killed. That's sick, isn't it, I said. He's kind of a sick guy. It's bait. He's giving the French military a reason to keep helping him out. I was quiet, the specter of what we were unable to talk about as present on my plaid sofa as the two of us were. This was the bait. 4,000 Africans had already been killed, but these were the bodies that were important. Later, years later, I learned that it was Mobutu who had had those white expatriates shot in order to blame it on the rebels and spur the French into action. He did it because he knew that the deaths of Africans wouldn't be nearly so provocative as the deaths of whites. And it was monstrous, yes, but more so was the fact that he was right. And I myself felt very little for the Kowesi neighborhoods I'd seen in the footage being rampaged and burglarized. I was the same person and wanted to stay that well, way. I, I felt I couldn't mourn everything. The only minor pang I ever felt was over one house, squatty and yellow and like the one I'd grown up in, but with black smoke billowing through the wrought iron bars on the windows. <clears throat> France and Belgium deployed parachutists to rescue their hostages. Morris Nudson finally began evacuating its base camp employees, sending them first to Masoni and then to Kananga. Thirteen Americans were left stranded in the country, an unlucky thirteen, but it didn't matter. Once the majority was airlifted to safety, Carter washed his hands of the whole affair. Slater's division no longer had to stay ready and he wasn't going anywhere, or so I assumed. The evening of the announcement, he called to say he was coming over. 
He showed up to my apartment and was taciturn until his third drink started taking its effect. He said he was going to Kowesi. They'd chosen him to help France with their tactical airlift support because he spoke the language. Even though he wouldn't be on the ground or jumping out of the plane, I was still terrified he'd be killed, but I congratulated him. I told him it was great news. I should go, he said suddenly in answer, meeting with some of the boys over at the ale house and then going to drive down and say my goodbyes to Sandra. Tonight, he shrugged, now or never. I walked him to the door. In the threshold, he put his hand out, and as I shook it, he looked into my eyes. He, lean, he leaned in, and for an instant, I thought he was going to kiss me, but then his mouth landed lightly on my cheek. I was surprised by how acutely I felt his absence. Perhaps it was because that was one of the loneliest periods of my life. I had never been away from New York before, from my home. My sister was gone, my mother was in Martinique, and my visits home to my father were still strained. He'd gotten angry with me for enlisting, which I'd been expecting, but it still hurt. It was six weeks before I saw Slater again. It was late at night when he called and asked to come over. When he arrived, his eyes were dark and he was full of hostile energy, manic. He paced my living room, picking up knickknacks, turning them over in his hands fiercely and tossing them back nowhere near where he'd found them. I mostly stayed quiet because he was so hard to read. He kept veering so quickly between sincere mirth, not levity and anger, that I was afraid of upsetting him. But finally I had to ask, what was it like? I couldn't help myself. I wanted to know what it was like up in the big T-28, uh, re <laughs> reconnoitering exotic terrain. I was expecting a stock answer, something about being proud to serve his country. It was completely fucked, he said forcefully, his eyes twinkling. Excuse my language. The whole thing was a mess. A bunch of different military personnel from a bunch of different countries mixed for a totally fucking disorganized shit show. Excuse my language. As he continued to talk, what he kept circling back around to was that every detail of the operation revealed how poorly suited the different military groups were to working with each other. For example, the plane he was flying was, of course, American, and so it was, of course, outfitted with U.S. military gear. But he said our parachutes used an entirely different carabiner system than the ones designed for French parachutists. The result was hours lost on trying to figure out how to attach the American chutes to French jumpers. And the big guy, the general, was hours late to our first briefing, flat tire Marie. And we couldn't get started without him, so the first day was just a bunch of waiting around. Everywhere I turned, something or someone was wasting time. And meanwhile, the rebels, rebels were still on the ground massacring innocent people. He sighed, and it didn't get any better once I was actually on the plane. Uh, by then, the whole operation had started to seem like such a spectacular failure that I kept fantasizing about nose diving into the canopy and killing the whole lot of us. He let out a short bark of a laugh as he looked to me to see how I'd react. I was quiet and tried to keep my face impassive, reserving judgment. You know me, I like, I like things to be neat, he said. I did know that about him. If it could be said that the most concrete motivation I'd had for joining the army was to get away from home, then he joined the Air Force because of an innate craving for rigidity. And of course he'd been disappointed. While our lives were dictated by rules and codes for behavior, combat is necessarily a messy and disorganized business. The one thing that was good, though, was being up in the air. I still love to fly. I wish I could have gone with you, I said. So you still believe in all of this, huh? He sat on the sofa beside me. Believe in what? I mean, why did you pick this, he said. Even back then, I wasn't naive enough to believe I knew the answer to that question. So I shrugged. I want to work in law enforcement. I wanted to fix the world, he laughed. He laughed, although nothing was funny. How stupid. Oh, come on, I said, meaning to convey that it wasn't stupid to be idealistic, but not wanting to be so trite as to actually say it. Everything is always so simple with you, he said. That's why I like you. I bristled, thinking that he perhaps was gently calling me stupid. It's a good thing, he said, sensing my annoyance. What I mean is you know how to break up the world into reasonable goals. You're able to say, I want to do this because it will lead to that, which will lead to that. You can say, I joined it for the experience so I could join the FBI. Everything just seems so satisfyingly linear with you. It must lead to less disappointment. I nodded, even though I didn't agree with his summation of my personality at all. No one's life was so simple. And less confusion. He took another sip of his drink and smiled again like a maniac. In the gloomy light of the place, he looked like a ghoul. Hey, you mind if I sleep here? I don't want to drive now. I was worried for an instant, thinking he meant in my bed. 
but he lay back on the sofa, cleaning it in a way that comforted me. I went to the linen closet, and by the time I had brought him a blanket, he was out of his boots. He thanked me, and I told him it was no problem, then went to my room and got ready for bed. When I woke up the next morning, it was early, but he'd already gone. Hi, uh, my name is Patel Stern. Um, I wanted to thank the center. Uh, it's really been a fantastic year. Uh, I really uh, am jealous of the new fellows because it's really a great experience. And, this is a, a portion of a short story called Why Why. A man walks into the bar, a clean-shaven man, wearing a mustache like he owns the place. He sits down at the counter, orders a scotch on the rocks, nurses it for a while, letting the ice melt, ruining the overpriced drink. For a time, it is only the two of them in the bar, the mustache man and the bartender. The man seems to be waiting for someone someone who never arrives. Finally, after the drink has been totally diluted that long, he downs it, orders another. During the second drink, he begins to talk. Ironically, it is also during the second drink that the bar begins to fill up. A few of the regulars come in, nodding to the bartender, sitting a little further down the counter or in one of the five booths against the wall. The bartender is busy, is trying to do his job, but the mustached man holds him with his talk, with his gaze. Something about the mustache man makes him interesting, in a non-threatening way. Like a rerun, you know will end badly. You think you remember reading the review of the series finale in a magazine a few years back, but you watch it anyway, with a certain grim fascination, either despite or because of that preordained knowledge. The mustache man asks the bartender his name. Mac, the bartender says, because he does not give his name to strangers. The mustache man says his name is Art Andrew. He says he was a lawyer before his partner killed himself and it takes him a few minutes to explain that he means his law partner, not his partner in life. And during those few minutes, the bartender has a picture in his mind that radically changes <laughs> once Andrew clarifies the details. That he left the law when he saw what it can do to people, that now he was searching for himself. In this, of all places, the bartender thinks. That he was in the city, visiting from Jersey. Well, not really visiting. He was supposed to meet a woman here, an internet day. But she hadn't showed, and now he has the whole night to kill. And what do you recommend doing around here, you know, for a little fun? And this whole time, the bartender is staring out slightly beyond Andrew, careful not to lose eye contact for more than a few moments while simultaneously eyeing the other patrons, wondering how much this mustache man is going to lose him tonight, wondering how everyone who is just the same as everyone else could seem so different, so special, so exceptional to themselves. And the mustache man went on, and the bartender noticed, not that he cared, really, that the, ma that the man had a birthmark on his lower lip that looked slightly like a turd, but only when the man smiled, and you could really see it, and the man likely knew this, the bartender realized, because he smiled so rarely. And the mustache man was telling the bartender about his ex-wife, as if he cared. Why would they think he cared? And she sounded legitimately awful, a shrew of a woman who worked as an actuary for a firm in Newark, who refused to have children when he wanted them, and now she was too old, he was too old, they were both too old. And they divorced, too late for him to start again, and now she was asking for alimony even though she was the one who was still working, who was earning a salary. And it was true that he had made money back when he was making money, but now his income was zero, zilch, nothing, and he had almost nothing left, and she wanted to take that money from him. And the bartender doesn't care. He simply does not care about this man, this Andrew, sitting in front of him complaining about his life, which sounds so similar to a story he heard a few nights ago, and another he heard a half dozen nights before that. It's not that he's callous. It's not that he's mean that he wants to not feel, feel sorry for this pathetic man who doesn't even have the balls to become a drunk, who invents dates for himself so he can sit in a bar and talk to a man he doesn't know about his problems because he's too cheap for therapy. It's just that there are so many of them, and once Andrew leaves, another will appear, and another will appear in his place. A long line of strangers angling to tell him their problems while losing him money, sipping their vodka sodas. Andrew is telling them, him that his ex-wife, Nanette, the name enters his consciousness with a strange force, and he realizes that he will remember it for at least a day, another wasted space in his mind devoted to the lives of others. She had never cheated on him, not once. She had always been faithful, and he had been faithful tr too. The bartender doesn't care if Andrew is telling the truth, if he is lying, doesn't know what Andrew is trying to prove to him, to himself, but he nods, hoping to, hoping to at least get a third drink down the man's gullet, earn something for all this unnecessary sorrow. He says not yet, though. He's still sipping his second drink. The ice is almost completely melted now. If the bartender had his way, he would throw it away. 
the drink, the glass, the whole fucking bar. Pack it up and put it away and go on a long trip. Away from this city, away from these people and their individual communal problems. Individual problems that were not individual at all, that were all the same. He would go, if he had his way, far and farther away, to some place where he could be free of company, of humanity, Alaska. Did I say something funny? It was Andrew. Compose your face, he thinks, realizing he is smiling, had lost eye contact, thinking of glorious escape, of the wild, open, free lands that America used to represent before being bought and sold and commodified. No, the bartender says, please go on, I am listening. Good evening, uh, my name is Rico Sisoko, and <clears throat> I'll echo my fellow fellows and say I have a lot of gratitude to the Center for Fiction, <clears throat> and more than um, the stipend and the fellowship would have provided for me with some validation. Um, this is an excerpt from my novel, it's called People of Color. The only option Cece had provided for herself if she didn't get into graduate school was to board a plane and fly to Africa. Where exactly in Africa was less her concern than the actual flip-flop of rubber sands on soil, the basin on head culture she imagined. She had had enough of college life in Boston, what she really wanted but could never tell her girlfriends, most of whom were headed to Wall Street or law school or other more definitive careers, was to study gender and women's studies, but instead she was graduating with a bachelor's degree in sociology and was utterly lost. In the final sprint that was the month of May, the Peace Corps began to seem like the best idea she had. The fact that her boyfriend Max had already signed his letter of commitment and that she lacked any semblance of clarity about her future, Max's utter confidence, his firm handshakes, his solid love, all of it kept her up at night, sighing and web surfing, pausing only to stare out her dorm window beside Max's snoring form to the concrete uh, parking lot eight stories below. Why couldn't someone just make these decisions for her? Most nights she stayed up until 2 a.m. playing online Scrabble or streaming TED Talk videos until Max complained about her desk lamp keeping him awake. Sometimes she Googled surprising combinations of girls and Africa, searching among the group photos for faces that were white or brown, wondering how many people of color joined the Corps. Patience, Max would say, rising from her bed, hugging her from behind, her arms folded at the window. Patience is all you need, Cece. The watery pallor of his blue eyes always surprised her, even in the middle of the night. What else could you want? His zen-like attitude did nothing for Cece. Days before her departure, she was running around, shopping at REI for gear that might be useful. Three setting headlamps, mosquito repellent, fast drying towels. Max teased her, ask her, asking if she was packing for summer camp. Her girlfriends offered conflicting advice, said Max was a stoner. There were times that she loved her girlfriends to death and other times when she resented their privilege, their summer houses and their finance internships and their dismissive, condescending attitudes towards the things she really cared about and that had made college bearable. Her student organizing for groups like Amnesty International and Students for Sexual Health. Queries for Economic Justice. Cece was proud to have the cell phone of the VP for Student Affairs in her contacts. Cece believed only fools suffered patience. She sensed in herself a lack of compassion, her aversion to kindness and love, something secular. In her mind, the decision to accept the Peace Corps offer was inextric inextricable with the voice of her mother, who loved her only daughter so intensely it made Cece queasy. She'd receive a text message from her mother reading, we believe in you, mahal kita, moms, and get that sinking feeling like she was 15, the good girl drinking in the cemetery with bad boys, responsible not only for her behavior, but her immigrant family's reputation. She'd taken her GREs last September and completed her applications in December. Three schools rejected her in March. Cece wasn't smart enough for grad school, plain as the white paper on which her rejection had been printed. How could her mother understand? No one else in her large Filipino family had yet to graduate from college. If Cece wanted to go to graduate school, her mother believed all she had to do was work hard. The Peace Corps was totally incomprehensible. Nelia, immigrant of seven decades, several decades from Manila, had urged her daughter to find work in their homeland if she wanted to travel. Your Tita Helen, I do a terrible Tagalog accent. Your Tita <laughs> Helen will provide you with the necessities, her mother said. You will have your own driver and a maid in Quezon City so that you can do your homework. Her mother still viewed intellectual life like this after watching Cece through four years of grueling midterms and finals of all-night research marathons for her senior thesis on the racialized feminism of Andamandieta. 
College, she believed, was just a big playground for smart kids. And now her daughter was not only going to live on the other side of the states, but all the way in a foreign country. Why didn't she just stay in Manila, doing whatever Sisi planned to do in Africa, a young girl all alone she could do just as easily in the Philippines, and do some service to her own people at the same time? Then Max broke up with her on a warm May morning, exactly two weeks before they were to graduate and embark on their great Peace Corps adventure slash premarital lives. Cece dumped her L.L. Bean backpack on the curb in front of the ivy-bricked Sioux and Services building and refused to join him at the last exam of their college career. The class was called Globalization and Social Justice, and Max planned to glance surreptitiously at Cece's answers in the vaulted 360-seat auditorium. Cece knew she'd pass the class whether she took the exam or not. She didn't care about paradigm shifts or globalization or the utter failure of first world democracy at that point. She just wanted her boyfriend with her in Africa. On the curb, Cece bawled like a schoolgirl, all the while hiding herself for succumbing to feminine stereotypes. Who cared about a fucking exam? Where had this boy she loved, but who no longer loved her, talked her into? What was she going to do now? Cece daydreamed Africa, even when she was in Africa riding the Metro Mass bus heading north toward Tamale. The wide grassy plains, the mountains as humble and knobby as the knuckles on her right hand, the dizzying light bright cities, their half paved roads and rotaries pulsing like the arteries of the heart. Telescoping in, she sees the Africans themselves, elderly and middle-aged and 20-something women, balancing bundles of firewood on their heads and a baby cinched around their backs in bright pounder cloths. Open air markets and packed dirt compounds and in more developed areas, working wells and knee-deep gutters and sagging power lines. You'd see all these things, and yet all CC could see was brown. Thank you. Hey guys, thanks for coming out. Um, and once again, thanks to the Center for Fiction. Um, there are so few organizations that you know support writers in doing what they do, so it's pretty awesome. Um, I'm going to read uh, sort of a condensed version of a short story, so there might be some like leaps in time, but hopefully it still makes sense. Uh, and one other thing to know is that um, towards the very end of the piece is the word mourning, and it's M-O-U-R-N-I, not M-O-R-N. Condition. I'm not sure that I'm supposed to get on an airplane in my condition. This occurs to me while I'm waiting for the kettle to boil to make my coffee before I pack, before the cab arrives. The device that sits in the spout, the one that is supposed to whistle once the water has boiled, disappeared years ago. I listen to the sound of the water to know when it's ready. It's easy now, my ear picking out that moment between the chaotic slosh of a building boil and the softer hum once it's ready to be poured. How it happened. I had been fucking a man. For fun or companionship, the Venn diagram had a lot of over overlap. I had been fucking a man for eight months, which means it was perhaps misleading to say that I had only been fucking a man. What else were we exchanging apart from bodily fluids? Phone calls. A pair of socks. Occasional ribbing with a tender core of jealousy. Was it you who was telling me about the Patti Smith book? Nope, that must have been some other poor bastard you're sleeping with. Just weeks after it had started up, Rena asked, but what do you want out of it? And when I shrugged, she said, you're always doing this and it never amounts to anything. She was in town visiting from Colorado and we were eating brunch. Her husband politely communed with his French toast when things escalated. There were the sounds of ice water being poured into durable restaurant glassware. A woman's laugh barked out in even syllables and my voice barbed above the din, telling her not everyone thinks of their life as a goddamn checklist with goddamn expiration dates next to each box. In my suitcase, I pack what I think I'll need, clothing that is easy to wash, clothing that hides stains well, comfortable shirts, two sticks of deodorant, one the kind that stops up your pores with aluminum, the other the kind that smells nice but does nothing. A small package of cellophane-wrapped butter cooker cookies from Rena's favorite pastry shop around the corner from the apartment she used to live in. I don't know how long I'll be there, so by default I pack a week's worth of clothing. Five shirts, two pairs of pants, two fistfuls of underwear. I had stared at the plastic baton on my counter, unclear of how to take the news. Two pinkish parallel lines and a stick sodden with my urine. 
In the movies, the woman runs to the store to buy at least three more tests, growing ever more distraught or overjoyed by the confirmation. I left the bathroom and poured myself a glass of orange juice, went back into the bathroom and leaned in the doorway, eyeing the stick as if it were some small wild animal. I took another sip of orange juice and stared, waiting for it to scurry up the wall. I was suddenly exquisitely thirsty, and it occurred to me that if I finished drinking the rest of the carton of orange juice, I would be sated in some fundamental way. I did. I was. In the afternoon, I fell asleep, woke to the dim light that signals either the end or beginning of a day. The pregnancy test stayed on the counter next to the sink for two weeks, exactly where I had left it. Some stray brown hairs had fallen over the top of its plastic exoskeleton. The pink lines had grown fuzzy, blown out like an old tattoo. A small bluish dollop of toothpaste next to it punctuated whatever it is it might say were it capable of speech. After two weeks of knowing, I called my mother. Hi, Ma, I said. What's wrong, she asked. Nothing's wrong. Oh, she said. Well, how are you? Fine, I told her. How are you? Oh, you know, she said, I'm doing fine, same as always. That's good, I said. After a moment of silence, her voice again. Well, I don't want to keep you. I know you're busy, busy, busy. Okay, I said, talk to you soon. I hung up, slid the pregnancy test into the garbage can, and scrubbed the bathroom until my knuckles were red and chapped. I stayed in my newly spotless bathtub for a long time, staring up at the pressed tin ceiling tiles corroded with rust. I wondered if I should call the man who impregnated me. On my phone, a set of four recorded recorded voicemails charting a narrative of him slowly tapering from my life. I replay the final one. Are you okay, he says. I guess call me, he says. Call me if you ever want to see me again. A pause. I have your socks. I washed them. I suddenly felt guilty that I hadn't been in touch, hadn't told him the truth of the situation. I wondered whether I should call him now, tell him that we had contracted something, only this was a baby, not a disease. Were the rules the same? I wasn't supposed to fly to Colorado until the following month, but then Rena's husband called. Can you come sooner, he asked. He was whispering and I could hear the baby crying in the background, Rena's voice somewhere distant, shushing, saying, shh, okay, okay, okay. Is she okay, I asked and noticed that I was whispering too. I talked to her a couple days ago and she said everything was fine. I heard the sound of the crying fading, a door closing, his voice still hushed now with an echo. She's scared, he said. She won't stop crying. Rena, I said, crying? Just this morning, he said. She was crying while she was breastfeeding him and when I asked what was wrong, she said, I think he wants to go back inside me. On the airplane, the stewardess apologizes. Yes, the flight to Colorado is almost four hours, but no, the TV lodged in the seat in front of me is not working. Could she get me a drink? A red wine on the house? I'd hesitated, the way I had when I went through airport security, wondering if I should ask for a pat-down instead of going through the full-body scanner. A red wine? I shrugged, looked to her for answers. The stewardess had taken this to be a yes. The man in the seat next to mine leans over as I pour the rest of my miniature bottle into a U.S. Airways cup. Flying makes me nervous, he says. It's as though he's lending me an excuse for drinking. I press the call button and ask for another red wine. Headed home or leaving home, my seatmate asks. I tell him I'm visiting a friend. That's nice, he says. She just had a baby, I say. His face lights up. Well, that's great, and what a good friend you are to be visiting, he says. I look down at the crossword puzzle from the in-flight magazine splayed open on my tray table. Someone has already filled it in. 32 down, clue, Belgrade resident, answer, fuck. 18 across, clue, concluding notations, answer, pussy, etc. I've been filling in the correct responses, Serb, Codas and tiny letters next to the hastily scrawled obscenities, but it's making me feel dull and humorless. Boy or a girl, the man asks. I'm not sure, I say. His forehead creases. Oh, I say, it's a boy baby. <laughs> the man nods. A sanctioned baby boy, I say. From the bathtub, I had typed, deleted, retyped a text message. Free for a drink tonight, I wrote. 
20 minutes later, the chiming of my phone. Sure. He asked why I wasn't drinking. Didn't you invite me out for a drink, he asked? Or did you mean something else by, here he paused to pull up the text message on his phone and read, free for a drink tonight? I told him I wasn't feeling well. What's been going on, he asked. I shrugged. Been busy, I said. I asked him about his job his roommate Ben's severe peanut allergy, whether his mother had decided to move upstate, whether the milk stout he was drinking was any good. I wanted to be able to tell him I couldn't. I kept an eye on his beer, and as soon as he finished the last sip, I told him I needed to go. He stared at the bar, running his middle and forefingers through the pool of condensation that had collected around his glass. Will I see you again, he asked, without looking up. Probably not, I said. He nodded once, as though confirming a diagnosis. God damn it, I said. Say something. He looked up at me. What am I supposed to say, he said. You disappeared, and now you're here, and now you're leaving. I picked his empty glass up, slammed it down on the bar. You're supposed to say what you want. Stop being a goddamn child and just say what you want. I stood up, walked out of the bar. The gate in front of the Methodist church was open and I stumbled inside so that I could puke behind the rose bushes. She opens the door and there he is, the tiny human cradled in the nook of an elbow. Say hi to your auntie, Rena says, and the baby's eyes remain closed, his mouth puckering as though he's just tasted something tart. I go to hug her and lose my balance slightly. The side of my head hits her teeth. Rena wraps her free arm around my neck. Are you drunk, she asks, her mouth at my ear. A little bit, I say. She holds me there for a long time. Hey, I say softly into her neck. I can feel her body start to shake. Hey, I say again. The two of us standing there, mourning in the doorway. That's it, thank you. My name is Jane Rose Porter. Um, thank you to the Center for Fiction, the Jerome Foundation, um, and best of luck to the new fellows this year. I'm going to be reading um, a short story called The Dinner Party. Um, it's from my collection of linked stories. Um, and the narrator of this story, um, Vera, came from the Soviet Union in 1979 um, and has been living in the States with her son-in-law for 30 years. The dinner party. When the black Maria rolled up behind the house, I was watering the roses. I can't say I was shocked. I knew one day they'd come for me, but I didn't think it'd be like this. Me outside in my house dress with the borscht on the stove and Wheel of Fortune starting up in 15 minutes. I was scared senseless the minute that police truck screeched up on the grass, cutting deep grooves into the dirt. Yurik would be mad when he got a load of the yard damage. Never mind, I went missing. I dropped the hose and it snapped and sprayed. Any minute now, the officer would march out, fling the back door open and shove me into the truck. How they'd found me here, upstate, 60 years after the war, I couldn't explain. Only that I knew they were coming. Knew I would be sent to Cresty Prison with its high red walls, then stuffed on a cattle car to the Gulag. That black Maria I'd seen so many times, trolling the Leningrad streets, shipping people off to their deaths, was right before my eyes. Same as the sun and the lake and that thorny bush of roses. Maybe, on second thought, I was a bit surprised. A moment later, when the doors swung open and I saw who was inside, I nearly passed out. Sitting right there in the van, playing dominoes, were Ella, Gabrielle, Mama, Misha, and so help me God, Anna Akhmatova in the flesh. All of them lifted champagne glasses up at me like it was New Year's Eve. L'chaim, Misha shouted, and they gulped their glasses dry. What are you waiting for, the Messiah, my husband called? He was just as always, crooning to be the center of attention. Oh, but I missed his drunken grin. All the years we were married, he was always rushing me along, as if he knew his heart would stop any minute, like it did. 
Hurry up and get in here, Misha said, yank and yanked me up into the truck and slammed its doors shut. Misha's hair was black as charred wood, just like it was the day we met. He was a fine looking man and I felt ashamed to have him see me in my old house dress, faded under the arms, my hair gray and oily and badly needing a wash. I'd grown lumpy around the middle too, a real American, they'd say. Everyone else in the truck shouted, Gorka, Gorka, bitter, bitter, like they'd done on our wedding day. And Misha wrapped an arm around my fat waist and kissed me, tongue and all, like we were sweethearts right after the war. The whole group laughed and cheered and lifted their champagne glasses for a toast. Gabrielle took my face in his hands, my sweet brother, and said, What are you waiting for, Vera? Drink up. I can't tell you what it's like to see your twin again after so long, like some vital part of you has woken from the longest sleep. Mama leaned forward and pressed her lips to my forehead. No fever, she said. You're lucky, you know. It's so breezy by that lake and you didn't even wear a jacket. What were you thinking going out like that? She hadn't changed a bit. You age well, she finally said, sitting back, satisfied. It was funny, what she said. After all, she looked younger than me by a good 10 years, all the meat still on her bones, like before the tuberculosis ate her up. Her cheeks were the softest pink, like a sweet plum. Mama pulled out a silver platter with a chocolate-covered cherry roll on it, and I could have died right there. I hadn't eaten Mama's cherry roll since I was a girl. Beside her sat Ella, my sweet child, just as before, just as beautiful as on her own wedding day. Her hair was long, her braid let out. Mama, get over here so I can smother you with kisses myself, she nearly sang to me. We've been riding around forever looking for you. I squeezed into the velvet-lined bench beside her. The van was so cozy and warm, as if a stove had been burning in it. I sank back into the plush seat. I was worried we'd never find you, Ella said. Only then did I notice, notice the tiny, gurgling baby asleep in her lap. He sleeps through the night like an angel, she said. Every time, he sleeps straight through. Well, I never thought I'd be cruising to heaven in a black Maria with everyone I'd ever loved and lost. And on top of it, Anna Akhmatova was there. She sat so quiet in the corner, I nearly forgot about her. Gabrielle leaned in and whispered in my ear, Isn't she sexy? He smacked his lips softly, and I punched him in the arm. The greatest Russian female poet ever to live, and he was ogling her like a chimpanzee. I suddenly felt famished and reached for a slice of cherry roll, but Mama batted my hand away. Not before dinner, she said, and then in front of us, the floor opened up and sprouted a table spread in salads and borscht and herring and blintzes with black caviar and a giant steaming pot of lamb stew. Anna held out a platter with hot pork pirashki and mugs of clear bouillon. All of us ate until our stomachs ached. Then Mama handed out thick slices of cherry roll and hot tea from a samovar and raspberry preserves like the kind she'd always boiled in summer. Misha belched loudly and grinned, pleased with himself. Soon we were singing songs stuffed and happy as geese. Gabrielle had his pants unbuttoned at the top to let some room in. What a grand dinner party, Anna announced. She was more beautiful than any painting or photograph I'd ever seen of her. Anna's eyes were gray-green, shimmering like water, and her skin was pale as bone china. Then the engine to the Black Maria started up, and the floor shook a little beneath us. By that point, I was drunk and full and happier than I had ever been in life. Gabriel smiled sleepily at me and nuzzled his nose in my ear. You know you're only dreaming, he said, in that teasing voice he used when we were kids. No, I said, and shoved him away as playfully as I could, but the feeling in the van had changed, as if someone had let a blast of cold air in. I looked around to see who else had felt it, but everyone was just as before. Ella, Mama, Misha, Gabrielle, Anna, even the baby, their faces spread in soft, dopey grins. No, I said again. I was shivering now, the chill creeping into my bones, then the van began to rumble under us, 
and I felt the splintering wood bench through my thin house dress, the air stale and sour. It was that familiar rumbling I knew from years back. Gabrielle knew it, Anna had written about it in her verse. Lest in blissful death I forget the rumbling of the black Marias, forget how that detested door slammed shut and an old woman howled like a wounded animal. Still, no matter how I searched their faces, I found nothing but those anesthetized smiles. Every one of them like grinning fools. I noticed the barred windows over our heads, noticed the yellow moon shining sickly as we rumbled along until I thought I might vomit. A prison dove cooed off in the distance, and I could see a ship sailing calmly on the Neva. Anna looked at me with her gray-blue eyes, heavy-lidded, and said, straight from the prologue of her requiem, that was when the ones who smiled were the dead, glad to be at rest. The van began to shake again, worse than before. Vera, Vera, I could hear the voice calling at me from outside the Black Maria. Vera, Mama, wake up. And there was Yurik shaking me, standing over the sofa where I lay stretched with my feet up. Wheel of Fortune was already in its final round on the TV behind him, Vanna clapping and clapping those long ballerina arms in a white beaded gown like a bride. Before I could so much as get a word in, he was blabbing. You shouldn't sleep in the evenings, he said. You know you won't get to bed at night. Come on and let's have some dinner. I wasn't the least bit hungry. I already ate, I said, and turned away from him on my side. But it was too late to go back where I'd been, of course. The dinner party was over. Thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Patricia Park. Uh, thank you all for coming out tonight and thanks to the center for making this all happen. Please excuse my voice, I'm just getting over a cold. Um, I'll be reading from a piece called How to Run a Grocery Store. This is from the section, Learn Your Demographic. Later, the realtors will coin the catchy alliteration Brownstone Brooklyn for the neighborhood. But for now, it's mostly middle class, mostly Italians, Cosa Nostra keeps the overflow from the projects at bay. The customer's accents are so thick, you could whir a deli slicer through them. You carry middle American merchandise, like Wonder Bread, Kraft cheese product in individual plastic sleeves, and Hellman's mayonnaise, but you also sell Hero Bread, fresh mozzarella, and radicchio. The meat section is stocked with the normal cuts of cow sirloin, T-bone, and the not-so-normal, tripe, which looks like an old bleached sponge, and tongue, and heart. On weekends and school breaks, you are enlisted as a bagpacker. You quickly learn that the worst thing you can do is make a customer feel like she's been cheated. This happens when you're stingy with the bags. Customers like lots of bags paper or plastic or paper and plastic. One customer demands each of her items, bread, eggs, GE 60 watt light bulbs, be packed in its own double bag. Then she collects them in beams, the way you might when you pull into a parking spot with a busted meter. Your family is met with a mixed reception. Once a woman shouts to your mother, fuck you people, I'm never shopping here again. Your mother bows her head, sorry, I'm so sorry. It is one of the first times you hear the F word, but you intuit its meaning. You get mad at your mother for not getting mad. But she is Zen, lose one customer, lose 1,000 customer. One week later, the customer is back, shopping cart brimming with merchandise. It becomes a running mantra for you, a life equation, lose 1,000 customer, and you, your brother, and your sister will lose your college funds. Learn to cashier. In truth, you're a horrible cashier. Cashiering is an endless game of memory. 
matching produce items with their corresponding four-digit codes, PLUs in industry parlance. On the spot, you mistake kale for collard greens, cilantro for parsley, a rookie mistake. Cashiering requires extemporaneous arithmetic. An example, a customer's total comes to $11.38. She hands you a 20 and you punch 2000. The computer screen may tell you the difference is $8.62, but when she fishes in her bag for two singles, a dime, and three pennies, you must compute the new total. No number two pencils, no scientific calculators, to a nice even $10 bill and three quarters. You are convinced there is an untapped market for pairing cashier jobs with high school students studying for the SATs. <laughs> So why start cashiering now? Because you got your college degree, but no one will hire you. College has taught you many things, like how to deconstruct your cashiering ineptitude through a number of theorems. One, spotlight effect. All eyes are on you, kind of like now. Um, two, stereotype threat. You're a girl, and girls are not supposed to be good at math. Three, reverse stereotype threat. But you're Asian, and aren't Asians supposed to be good at math? Four, Freudian neuroses. You're experiencing sensory overload. C.F. Proust, Remembrance of Things Past, Volume 1, Swan's Way. Five, Piagetian critical period. You should have learned to cashier between the ages of zero to two. <laughs> Six, cognitive dissonance. You know how to phrase your dilemma in the form of a Hegelian dialectic. What you don't know how to do is scan items and pack them at the same time, the supermarket equivalent of chewing gum while walking down the street. Relearn your demographic. The neighborhood is changing. The new arrivals are not the olive white of the old timers, but a pinkish purple under a translucent film of skin. Their eyes are varying shades of Mayflower blue. The new customers bring their own bags. This is a new concept to you. Pack your bags using your bags. These bags, made of nylon or cloth, say things like Whole Foods, Fairway, Trader Joe's. When they forget to BYOB, they let out passive aggressive exhalations to stop you from loading their groceries into a second plastic bag. You're still not sure whether this is better than having customers think you're stiffing them. The, cus the store's new customers are not like the Italians. The Italians put up a fight, but they always pay in cash. The new customers speak in a honeyed sotto voce as they hand over their cards. Debit or credit, you ask. Credit, they say. Always credit. Thank you. Um, so before we break for wine, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our next group of emerging writers for this year. Um, it was a particularly competitive process for us. We received over 470 high quality submissions for nine spots. Um, and we're proud to present our winners tonight. Um, so I'll say their names and ask them to stand up and give a little wave to you all. So they are Lisa Armstrong of Brooklyn. Arndt of Manhattan, uh, Ziva Bukai of Brooklyn, Alicia Chang of Brooklyn, uh, Su Yi Lin from Queens, uh, Cedric Mendoza Talentino of Manhattan, uh, Dwyer Murphy from Brooklyn, Bilal Rafiq from Manhattan, and uh, Will Weitzel of Manhattan. Thank you guys so much for coming tonight.